Hi, I would like to flash out everything that we've been discussing um, uh, against simulations. So FAT has this really nice simulations and I would like to show you everything that we've been discussing the last two days on simulations. So what you're seeing right now is um, a square well with energy chosen above the well. And there is a solution for any uh, uh, value of energy. There exists a solution for any value of energy. Now, what I'm showing below is the probability density, the total psi star psi uh, at any given point in space. And what I'm showing above is just the real part of the wave function. And I'm choosing uh, to show not the sum. So here's what the sum looks like. And here are the two individual components. So in region two, there is the transmitted component. In region one, there is the incident and the reflected component. Uh, and inside the well, there are also a right moving wave and a left moving wave. So you can actually, uh, it's a good exercise for yourself to check uh, that when you superpose two plane waves with the same wave number and you look at psi star psi, you're gonna get these ripples. That's why it looks like uh, the probability density is oscillatory here, it's oscillatory here, but here is just a single wave number component, so the probability density is a constant. As I increase the energy, notice what happens to the transmission and reflection coefficients. So you see, as I change the energy, uh, they change. And there is a spot, there is an energy at which you get oh, a perfect transmission. So you see the reflected, the amplitude of the reflected component I'm just showing just the real part here, is zero. The amplitude of the transmitted component is the same as the amplitude of the incident component. And inside the well, you fit in, if I, let's see if I can pause this. I don't know if I can pause, but you can, yeah. You fit in equal number of wavelengths inside. At any time, uh, there's always an equal number of wavelengths. So that's the resonance, right? As energy increases above that resonance, now you get a little bit of reflection. So again, this is the real part of the transmitted wave. This is the real part of the incident wave. And the small one is the real part of the reflected wave. What happens to the left is the sum of the uh, incident and the reflected. Again, this is just showing the real part. So here's the imaginary part. Um, and here's the, here are the magnitudes of each uh, component. So, uh, this is the psi star psi of the total wave function. And in principle, we have a similar situation if we invert that. So I presented this in the lecture, your textbook presents this. And again, you can see that in general, it, basically it's a similar story, right? You have transmitted, you have reflected, and there exists these resonances where you get a uh, perfect transmission. Qualitatively, it's not different. Uh, the only thing that's different about it are the formulas for reflection and transmitted, transmitted coefficients as a function of energy. So this is a wave function with a well-defined energy. We saw that such wave functions are sums of uh, plane waves. And we're restricted to the, to the situation where the amplitude of the left moving wave in region two is zero to correspond to a physical situation where particles are incident from the left. Now, this might make you feel a little bit uneasy. So there are two problems with this. First, if I, I'm gonna hide this now. So if you look at the probability density, it's uniform everywhere. And first, it might make you feel like, well, if there's equal probability, then if there's a constant non-zero probability, uh, constant time-independent probability that particles to the left and particles to the right, you might say, well, I hear that your solution is a sum of right and left moving wave in region one that corresponds to incident and reflected, and it's a right moving wave in region uh, in region three that corresponds to transmitted. But if I just look at the probability density, I don't see any temporal dynamics. It just says that this is the wave function such that if I measure the position of the particle, I have equal probability to find it here and this uh, uh, oscillating probability to find it here. Looking at the probability density, it's not obvious that this is 
that this corresponds to shooting particles from the left. Uh, and moreover, this is not a normalizable wave function. So plane wave solutions are, they don't exist in nature. Uh, you have to build wave packets out of a linear combination of plane wave solutions. So the next thing that I wanna do is I want to show you what happens when you actually shoot a wave packet against barriers and wells and things like that. Now wave packets, wave packet solutions are more complicated. It's more complicated what happens when you shoot a wave packet and it uh, hits a barrier. So in introductory classes, people often talk about uh, a single wave number component like we did. And your textbook has a nice interpretation. It says that, however, in cases we considered here, we will use it to represent a, a, a steady beam of particles all moving in the positive direction where the coefficient on the left is related to the number rather than probability per unit distance. So you can, uh, you can think of, um, you can reinterpret what we're doing here as shooting a steady beam of particles where this is not the probability, uh, but number per unit distance, right? So if uh, there's, if it's larger on the, to the left of the well and to the right of the well, that means few particles get through, most are reflected. So there's gonna be more particles to the left of the well and less particles to the right of the well. So it's kind of a reinterpretation, but really what we really should be doing is we should be sending wave packets wave packets are normalizable and a wave packet actually has a uh, motion, right? So if I uh, switch to wave packets, which is what I'm gonna do next, you will see that the probability density actually moves through time. And that makes more sense. If I shoot a particle, I'm more likely to find it here at one instant of time, more likely to find, most likely to find it here at another instant of time, most likely to find it here at another instant of time. And uh, the general solution of the Schrodinger's equation uh, for free particle is a superposition of plane waves. And that's really how we should represent uh, freely moving particles, not by plane waves, but superposition of plane waves, uh, which are uh, wave packets. So first, let me show you what happens with no potential uh, barrier at all, just a constant potential energy. Uh, and if I shoot a wave packet, you see that this is the wave packet. Now wave packet is not made up with a single harmonic, right? Uh, so it's made up of uh, harmonics of multiple Ks, so therefore multiple momenta, and therefore multiple kinetic energies. And so that's why you see an energy spread here. So let me try to do it again. Uh, I'm going to shoot, uh, I'm gonna place the initial condition right here. And notice what happens. We didn't discuss so much. We didn't discuss wave packets because they're actually tricky mathematically. You have to do Fourier analysis. But you can see that a wave packet doesn't just move, it also spreads. And the reason it spreads is because of the relationship between wave number and frequency, uh, what I call dispersion relation. The reason it's called a dispersion relation is because it tells you how the uh, pulse disperses. We didn't really discuss that, but I just wanted to uh, bring back the meaning of that dispersion relationship. For wave packets uh, in quantum mechanics, for free particles in quantum mechanics, Omega is proportional to K squared. If Omega was proportional to K, the wave packet would not disperse. And if it's proportional to K to some power, the wave packet will generally spread out. Uh, that's why it's called dispersion relation. But here, here's the free particle wave packet. So you can see the wave packet moves to the right. Uh, it means that, well, what it means is that if I measure the position of particle particles at this point, I'm most likely to find them here. But if I wait a little bit more, and instead perform a measurement now, I'm most likely to find it at this point. And if instead I waited more and performed the position measurement now, I'm most likely to find it here. So that sort of corresponds to uh, a, a moving particle. Um, and this is also a solution to the uh, uh, free particle Schrodinger's equation, but it's a normalizable solution. So uh, this is how we, um, a free particle should really be represented. So what happens if I shoot the wave packet against the potential barrier? Okay, so let me uh, demonstrate first the following thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, make the wave packet a rather broad so that energy 
is a rather uh, uh, rather well defined, right? So it's there is a spread in energies because there is a spread in wave numbers, therefore spread in momenta. Uh, so it's not a single harmonic, but you can see <clears throat> that in this case uh, the energy is above the well. And just watch what happens. So I'm going to place the wave packet here, and here comes the wave packet. Uh, let me try to redo this from scratch. And here comes the wave packet. Uh, what's going on? Just a second, let me pause. I had the pause turned on. So let me, uh, here comes the wave packet. You see the wave packet arrives and it's about to hit the barrier. And when it hits the barrier, something rather complicated happens. But when all the dust settles, you have transmission and you have reflection. Let me do the following thing. I'm going to zoom so you can see what's going on. Here comes the wave packet. It hits the barrier. There's something really complicated goes on. But after that, you have a transmitted packet and then you have a reflected packet. And I discussed that in the lecture. So during the collision of the wave packet with the barrier, it's something complicated. But after that, you have the wave packet, transmitted wave packet and a reflected wave packet. Let me try to do it again. Here comes the wave packet. It interacts with the barrier, something complicated. And then when long after all is said and done, you have the right moving wave packet and the left moving wave packet. These are scattered, uh, scattered uh, uh, parts of the wave. And that's what you would expect from a wave, right? If I ping a rope and there's a knot here, okay? So the, the pulse moves, it hits the knot, there's something complicated goes on. And then after you have, long after the interaction, have uh, the reflected uh, part of the wave and the transmitted part of the wave. So what happens now if, yeah, and by the way, exactly the same uh, thing happens in spirit if I have the inverted uh, situation, uh, if I have something like that. So I can uh, shoot a wave packet. And this is really interesting, uh, classically, this wouldn't happen. You would not get a reflection. You would get only transmission. But quantum mechanically, you see the probability density ends up having a transmitted pulse, a transmitted piece, and a reflected piece. This is very interesting. So let's go back uh, to this situation. And now we can study tunneling. So let me pause. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the energy so what I'm going to do, I'm going to move this a little bit here. And I'm going to make the energy uh, below the well. Now, you will see that if the wave packet now hits the well, there will be uh, a small transmitted uh, bit. It's very hard to see here, but if I make the well narrower, you will see that there will be a transmitted bit right here. Right here, you see that there is a transmitted not a, not a big one. So the probability, the area under the transmitted wave packet is small, but there is a transmitted wave packet. Um, you might say, well, yeah, that's because you have a continuum spread of energies and maybe it's just the tail of energies. Maybe really just there's a tiny bit of a tail uh, of this energy spectrum that's above the well. Well, no problem. What I can do is I can make this taller and taller of course, that, that's going, going to make the transmission probability smaller and smaller. So to compensate, I have to make this narrower and narrower. But this is still a situation where classically, you would not get a transmission. You agree? You would not get a transmission. But here, uh, we get a transmission. So let's see. Um, let's, let's, try, uh, let's try this from scratch. So here comes uh, the wave packet. And you see you get a transmission. You get actually a transmitted part of the wave packet. So this is genuinely a tunneling. This is not energy being uh, uh, above uh, the barrier. So here you go. So I think this is a little bit more believable because when we talked about tunneling, really we talked about plane waves and you might say, well, this, this just says that there's a probability to find a particle to the left and the probability to find the particle to the right that's there in perpetuity. Uh, you don't see sort of dynamics. Uh, th there's no dynamics in this probability density. So it makes one a little bit queasy about whether this is really a tunneling or it's just 
It's just a stationary solution to the Schrodinger's equation with probability on the left and probability on the right. So therefore, showing you what happens when you shoot wave packets is more believable. But having said that, well, wave packets uh, are made up of harmonics. And what we really did is we studied, we, we extracted probability of transmission with just one single harmonic. Well, single harmonic, they're not really realistic solutions. Really, you need superposition of harmonics to make the wave function normalizable. But these are like training wheels. And uh, it's a solution on which we can get sort of the biggest bang for the buck. We can see that uh, there, we, can, we can extract the fact that there is a probability of transmission. And if we want a more mature problem, a real problem, we really should be shooting wave packets. And then qualitatively, still the same thing holds, right? So here comes the wave packet. It interacts with the barrier. Part of the wave packet is transmitted. Uh, part of the wave packet is reflected. But during the collision of the wave function with the barrier, it's a complicated process. That's why we studied the dynamics of a single harmonic and we interpreted as much of the result as we could with just a single harmonic. But it is de definitely a genuine tunneling problem that we did today. Just with a single harmonic, it's not very realistic, but uh, it's a kosher problem. It's a kosher tunneling, it's, uh, it's an actual tunneling. So I wanted to, since we're talking about tunneling, I wanted to tell you about an interesting application. Uh, so let me stop sharing just one second. So by the way, if you want to play with that simulation, you can go to phet.colorado.edu, phet.colorado.edu, and then select quantum uh, physics, quantum phenomena, and it's called quantum tunneling and wave packets, if you want to play around with this. But I want to tell you about one application that's not discussed in your book. So your book discusses tunneling diodes, which are used in electronics, and it also discusses radioactive decay, which is a fantastic example of tunneling. But there's another interesting example. I'm just going to say a few words about it, just for fun. This is called tunnel, tunnel ionization. Uh, this is called tunnel ionization. And here's what happens. So let's say you have an atom. Now here's the potential energy of an atom. It looks like this. And bound state solutions exist with certain well-defined energies. It's a bound state solution, right? So you have solutions like that. These are allowable energies. Now, if you want to ionize, and let's say you have an electron that occupies this energy level. And if you want to ionize this electron, you need to supply energy to the atom that equals, uh, that equals this amount, right? So you need to supply this much energy. How you supply it, it depends. I mean, an atom can collide with another atom and that other atom can transfer that energy in the form of kinetic energy and pop, well, you know, you, you, will, you can uh, pop out the electron or you can shoot uh, light and atom can absorb light. And when it absorbs light, uh, the electron uh, can come out. So that would be more like photoelectric effect. But if you don't have enough energy, let's say you need X-rays and you don't have X-rays, then you cannot generally ionize an atom. You might be able to allow the electron to jump from N equals one to N equals two if you supply just the right amount, amount of energy, but you cannot ionize. So how would you ionize this atom, or how would you kick out an electron uh, from a particular uh, level out of the atom when you don't have enough energy? Well, one thing you could do is you could try to shoot two for, you, there's a very, there's an infinitesimal probability that an atom gets hit by two phot photons at a time, right? Each photon supplies some energy, so atom absorbs two photons. Probability for that is extremely small. Uh, maybe it's even uh, vanishingly small, I'm not sure. But you can also uh, do the following thing. So notice when uh, light comes in, classically, it's made up of electric and magnetic fields. So if you shoot a pulse of light at an atom, there is really a pulse of electric field. So for a brief instant, in addition to electron experiencing this potential energy, this is due to its interaction with the nucleus, right? So you have nucleus and then you have an electron 
and the interaction of nucleus with the electron gives rise uh, to this potential energy. But when pulse of light comes in, there's additional uh, electric field, not just due to the nucleus, but also due to the, that pulse of light. Now, electron in a uniform electric field experiences uh, a linear potential energy profile or linear potential. You might remember U equals Q times V and V is the integral of E dot dx. If E is constant, you get a linear profile. So with the external E field, uh, this kind of, uh, so this, this kind of potential energy uh, gets modified to a superposition of this plus this. So the net, so this is potential energy due to the interaction with the nucleus. That's like one over R type potential energy. Again, it's the integral of the electric field of the nucleus uh, uh, dot dr. And this is potential energy due to interaction with the external uh, field. Really, it's not a permanent field. It's a pulse. So this thing exists briefly, but I'm oversimplifying it. And so the net potential energy of the electron interacting uh, with both the, the nucleus, the nuclear electric field, and the externally imposed electric field is the sum of these two things. And it will look like this. It will be a combination of these two things. That's what it will look like, again, briefly. Suddenly, you can allow a tunneling process. So if the energy was this, now this becomes a scattering state. And the electron, so you form basically, you form a barrier. You form a barrier. And the electron can make use of that short-lived barrier to tunnel out. Electron can tunnel out. And it's a real effect and it's used, it's uh, studied in the labs, it's state of the art, and this is called tunnel ionization. Tunnel uh, ionization. So what I've been doing is, you know, with this simulation and with this example, it's an attempt to build comfort for you around the idea that tunneling is a real genuine effect. It's not some sort of a trick. And you really can ionize uh, atoms uh, by this process and boom, you can find an electron here. And then this external electric field just sweeps the electron down, you get a current. And so it's a real thing. And it's a really, I think it's a really interesting example of tunneling uh, in addition to the ones that are mentioned in your textbook. Uh, okay, uh, great. Thank you. I hope this was fun. I'll see you later.